Welcome, Welcome to the Josh Hall Web Design Show. Web Design Show, helping you build better websites and create a web design business that gives you freedom and a lifestyle you love. Hello, friends. Welcome into episode 189 of the podcast. I'm so excited to bring you this episode and to bring you an interview with someone who is. I think maybe one of the most charismatic, engaging, and funny people I've ever met. Definitely within the entrepreneurial realm and and dare say just in life in general. My guest in this episode is Jill Salzman. She is the founder of an awesome online community and website called foundingmoms.com. And she is also the host of a really interesting narrative podcast called Why Are We Shouting, which I'm going to recommend you check out after listening to this episode and getting to know Jill. But it was interesting because I met Jill on a panel with Circle. Circle is the platform that I run both of my online communities on, my web design club, which is my coaching community, and my student center. And you know when you meet somebody and you can tell, I like this person, like immediately, That's how I felt about Jill. I think you're going to feel the same way too. And I invited her on this podcast to specifically talk about her insight on customer retention. And that's kind of a fancy term for saying keeping clients coming back to you over and over and over again. Jill does this and practices this in her business with Founding Moms. And she has a lot of interesting insight on this. And it's interesting, you'll find out, she was actually in the music industry and then she got into the online entrepreneurial world. She just is a wealth of interesting insight and I think really practical insight on keeping clients coming back to you over and over again instead of just hustling and going after new clients all the time. Because that's what so many business owners and new entrepreneurs do, I feel like. There's so much emphasis on hustle and sales and new clients. But what about the clients you already have? The good news as web designers is you can keep them coming back over and over and over and over again. So you don't have to sell so much. And I found it just makes life better in business because you can just enjoy your clients. They already know you. You already know them. They already like and trust you and know you. And they'll just keep on buying from you. But the trick is you got to retain them. And if you're curious, well, how the heck do I do that? This episode is going to empower you in so many ways to keep them coming back. And again, Jill is just one of the funniest and most engaging people I've met in my journey as an entrepreneur. I can't wait for you to meet her. This is Jill Salzman. Again, check out her podcast too, Why Are We Shouting? After this one, which yours truly will be on, I think maybe by the time this comes out, if not shortly thereafter. Uh, But she's awesome. And I do want to say, if you're curious about some of the more like practical things on how to give a really good experience to your customers, I do have my business course, my web design business course, which is literally my entire process, all of my SOPs, my standard operating procedures for helping you build an amazing web design business to keep your clients coming back. So that's going to be available for you uh, anytime you want. You can go to joshhall.co slash business for that. And from, for now, enjoy this interview with Jill Salzman. We're going to talk, keep the nose clients coming back. We're also seriously about to have some fun. So get ready. Jill, welcome on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad that I could match for you today. I just want everyone to know this is very unintentional. I know for everyone watch because this is audio and visual. So the video of this goes on my listening. I literally have hung a backdrop behind me that matches my sweater identically. And I might start doing this from now on and only buy backdrops that match my clothing. It's just a floating Jill head, which adds a whole nother element to this show. So definitely everyone watching, or if you're just listening, you got to see the video of this. Which Jill, I'm pumped to talk with you because you are funny. You're super charismatic. Uh, We actually, we met on a panel for circle because I know you're, you're a big circle gal and you have a community. And we hit it off. I was like, I like, I feel like, I, I don't know. know. If it's I was a, like, I don't, cool. I, yeah, that's what most people think when they talk to oh, me, but I don't it, know if it. I am a judgmental person, but like within a one and a half seconds, I can tell whether I'm going to jive with somebody or not. I so, think that's very human. No, at, okay. well, yes, and you're judgmental, but I also think it's very human and there's not a single person that doesn't do that. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Because the older I've got, the more I realize like instantaneously, I can be like, I feel like I could drive with that person. And it's not that I don't like somebody. It's just like, we're not, we're not probably going to go grab a beer. 
Yeah, I mean, and, yeah. what's your sign, baby? You know what I mean? Like this, it's just sort of a wavelength thing. There it you is. Know? The wavelength. I like that. Perfectly <laughs> said on an audio podcast and stuff. Uh, so before we dive in, Jill, we're going to talk about customer retention. And I love this topic and this idea because it's literally how I built my business. My business was a hundred percent referral base as a designer. And as I become a course creator and a community builder, especially as a community builder, I'm yeah. learning that I need to give more emphasis to my current clients to keep them coming back rather than hustling for new ones. So I know that's what you're about as well. Before we dive in, do you want to let my audience know first off where you're based out of? And I'd be curious uh, when somebody asks you what you do, if they don't know you, what do you tell them? Yeah, I am based out of a rainbow dungeon. If you're watching, I'm sorry, if you're listening, you can't see that I'm in Chicago stuck in a basement with a giant rainbow brick wall. Uh, I'm originally from New York. I started my third company, which is my current company, 11 years ago. It's called The Founding Moms. I usually tell folks that I am entrepreneurship on steroids is really what I say. Mm. But I run a community that helps mom entrepreneurs build better businesses. And uh, we provide a lot of education and resources and inspiration for any mom entrepreneur that's looking to get better at marketing or branding or sales for her business. Um, that's what I do by day. I mean, I have a podcast that mm -hmm. also is entrepreneurial. Uh, and I, I've written a couple books, but mostly I love doing this and talking about things like customer retention, because it, it's, to me, it's so important. And how can you not talk about it? But a lot of people are not. Yeah, let's, so your podcast is, uh, why, why are we shouting, right? Why are we shouting? You have to say it like that. Okay, why are we shouting? That and That's the podcast. Yes. And of course, and yes. yours it's truly will be on at some point. It's a weekly podcast that is just a story every week of how someone screwed up in their business. It's just Which mistakes. is gold. I love that. Mistakes Wonderful. are awesome. Best lessons. Things that went wrong, lessons we've all learned, uh, very honest and very uh, narrative. Not really, it's not a conversation like this. This is much yeah. more fun. <laughs> yeah, I know. I had, I had fun sending you in an audio clip about my business card, which is a comical thing because as a lot of folks listening and watching know, my business card, my first business card had drum lessons along with my web design and graphic design services. Classic. Although it actually turned out to be kind of a, a really good story to, to bring up over the years of what well, not to do. But it, yes. hey, it was memorable. And I think clients remember like, oh, Josh, that web designer who did drum lessons. Hey, maybe it was a genius marketing move on my part. Yeah. But honestly, I think it was. And there are a lot of <laughs> that I know who do things like that. So you're not the only one. Not the only one, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. But your podcast is not the founding moms. Why is that? And do you think, and I asked this in regards to customer retention, because I would think personally, yeah. A podcast, the Founding Moms podcast, to me would just fit perfectly with your online community brand. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And in fact, if you want to call it that, you're more than welcome to. But I don't call it that, uh, partly because if anybody sees in their little podcast library, the Founding Moms podcast, it turns away a lot of entrepreneurs who have a lot of assumptions about moms, about founding moms. And the stories that we tell while told by mom entrepreneurs are for anybody who is building a business. So to your point, it's not 100% on brand, but I don't mean for it to be. Mm -hmm. I just want people to hear these crazy stories because no one is talking about mistakes made in business nearly enough. And I'm trying to Personally, I'm on a mission to eradicate that whole notion that like everything is so awesome in my business and I'm doing a billion dollars every month. It's just, that's silly. So, well, there's not that many people doing that. And a lot of those people are stressed and they, or they have huge teams and they've been doing it for a decade. So oh, well, like a lot of chatter though, about how well people are doing when they're not doing so well. So, but that's very true. That's very true. And you may have done well, like one year, but maybe the next year is different with that's, trends that's and I mean. changes. And I, yeah. Yeah. You're, you're a rarity in that sense. And you might be, um, you're just much more transparent and able to be vulnerable. And while I wished I could say that about everybody, you are in the minority in my mm. year. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I appreciate that in the entrepreneurial world, because I think that's more important than ever. Um, yeah. I do feel like there's a new 
kind of keeping somewhat on topic of, of your current customers, I think there's a new wave of just being a chill entrepreneur. And I might start a side brand called that one day. I don't know, but just like living the life you want to live. If you need to make $75,000 to live the life you want to live, then that's what you do. Like that's, I, I'm not really interested in being at seven figures. I'm, I'm not at that point. I don't really need to right now. I don't need that much. I like being the the quarter mil, the quarter million entrepreneur is like, seems to be have a small team, live the lifestyle yeah. you want to live, lower expenses, but like we're building a new house right now for me and my family. But I'm not making millions of dollars. We don't need to. Right. We don't need to go I don't I don't have those aspirations I guess yet right now. Um but right. it all goes back to like lifestyle approach, balance and and just kind of figuring out what you want. But I've got students like depending on what season of life they're in or if they're in different parts of the world, they don't need a massive income. Correct. And that's kind of freeing nowadays, right? Do you find that like freeing? Like it is possible for anyone to be an entrepreneur and make what you want to oh, make. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, absolutely. What's interesting as you're talking, I'm realizing that I have never been the type of entrepreneur to think about things in terms of goals. I did not set out to say, I'm going to make this many zeros in my, you know, at the end of the year, I'm much more, this sounds so corny really, but I'm much more about the journey, Josh. Which is awesome. That way. But what I mean by that is that I really want to impart to other entrepreneurs. Part of my job is to make sure you know business doesn't have to be boring. We can have a lot of fun while we're doing it. You can make a very comfortable living and don't need to go off and scale like all of, I don't know, Entrepreneur and Inc. magazine tell you is pretty yeah. necessary. So I find as since that's my job and as part of my own journey. I want that to be your journey. And if seven or eight figures hits, great. Awesome. But it's not where I begin. And I don't think it's where other people should start. Agreed. When did you start? When did you start your entrepreneurial journey? Lemonade stand age five, first adult company. That sounds bad. First company as an adult uh, <laughs> that is the importance of copywriting and where you place it words. <laughs> it is. That's just quite a switch there. But if I make uh, the title Jill's first adult company, this will get a ton of views. You we'll know what? To Let's go viral, baby. Uh, <laughs> but my first company in two, 2005, I managed bands for a living and I did their booking. I did their publicity uh, for many years. And I started my second company two years into the first one. Okay. That's so funny. I just talked with somebody earlier in the UK who managed concert venues. So there seems to be a common trend. He's, he's also an author and, uh, very similar. There seems to be, if you can manage bands and, uh, manage artists and creatives, then by golly, you can do anything online. That's for sure. That's like, that's, that's built to be a good entrepreneur who can delegate and get the most out of creatives. Yeah. Well, it's just quite a zany industry, that music industry. And I think if you work with creatives, you're working with, I mean, they're all entrepreneurs. So you're, yeah. you're sort of working with folks and watching what they're all screwing up so well, that you can do it better. And that's what you said earlier is totally true. Me being a drummer, I did, I had imposter syndrome big time early on because I was like, I didn't go to school for web design. I'm mm-hmm. not, I didn't come from this background. I was a drummer and a cabinet maker. Like it feels weird to get into this. Come to find out later on in my journey now, everyone I know who are successful web designers and entrepreneurs and doing yeah. what they want to do came from, most of them came from music background or something way different, which is oh, awesome. Yeah. It, it's, I think it also, that experience gives you a versatility. You probably have carried into your business. My current graphic designer that I've worked with since 2005, I grabbed her from the music business. She used to just do posters for bands. Mm. Now she's an extraordinary designer and developer who also has come a long way. And I think probably would tell you she still has imposter syndrome because, because with roots back in the music biz, a lot of us identified very strongly with who we were as musicians or managers in it or concert venue manager, whatever he was. Um, Yeah, I love it. And I've carried it all the way to a community now where I work with mom entrepreneurs, but I have sort of carved out and created this company that's based on what I learned working at a record label where each artist had its own street team. And so I, I've basically like copied and pasted what I learned in the music biz and applied it to just, there's different subject matter, but 
Same, same. That's beautiful. No, I love that. It's, it's a great testament of how a seemingly unrelated industry will transfer perfect to online entrepreneurship, Yes, which is really cool. Now, how long did it take you to know that you wanted to focus on moms in particular and founding mom entrepreneurs? Um, did you, was that because of your experience and what you've experienced in your business growth? Like, and how old is this brand? That's kind of a follow-up question because it seems like, yeah. you know, your, your demographic pretty well. I really do. I, uh, to answer your question, I did not want to work with moms. I, my first company was in 05. I had my first baby in 07. Started my second company in 08, had uh, my second baby in 09. Did you see the lapse? I've completely forgot when I had a child, even though I was there. Uh, so because I was running two completely unrelated businesses, one was music management. The second was I ran a baby jewelry company, Josh. Oh, what? wow. I'm not even into jewelry. So I was running two unrelated businesses ready to have two kids in my tiny home office. And I essentially just freaked out of how do people do this? How do you, mm. how do you complete a phone call while there's a screaming kid? You know what I mean? All those parenting and business building questions. And no one at the time was answering those questions. I was going to a lot of women in business networking events where everyone was, in, there was business suits everywhere and nobody had any spit up on them. And, you know, I would go to yeah. like entrepreneurial groups and it would be all dudes and no offense to dudes, but I was, you know, I was nursing a baby. So anyway, there's difference there. Look, I'm a dad entrepreneur, <laughs> but there's a difference that moms go through. I actually had uh, a colleague of mine a few episodes back about mompreneurship and how that looks different than, than a dadpreneur, especially when you are the mom of a baby, if you're breastfeeding or whatever that looks like, there yeah, are I, more, yeah. there are definitely more challenges. There's also hormones involved postpartum there. There's a lot of different things involved. So yeah, I, I get that. He's saying all of that. Cause this is usually very dirty territory to get into to. And I don't, I think parenting in general, male or female, very, very hard to do when you're building a business. But, I, but there are, you know, like a mom who's nursing is attached to the baby a bit more than the dad, et cetera, like you just said. Right. So to that end, all I did was go and start a meetup locally in Chicago and said, if you have a business and a baby, come tell me how you're doing this. Cause what? And I thought it was going to be a tiny meetup and I was going to continue along with my businesses. But so many women came to the first one. We decided to do it every month. Mm. It grew. You know, somebody said, could we have a second meeting elsewhere? And I, I think six months in to, to trying out this meetup, I realized, oh, there's a business here. So I, I just sort of like found my way into the mom entrepreneur world because I was struggling, looking for camaraderie. Yeah, And then it turned out everyone else was too. So I think I just took my entrepreneurial cap, put it back on. I closed up the music management business. I sold the baby jewelry business. And I was like, I'm going to do this thing and see where it goes. So you were your ideal client. And then essentially yeah. you, you were a founding mompreneur who struggled with running business, growing your business, feeling a part of yeah. an online community tribe. Whereas again, yeah, it's probably a bunch of like, hustle dudes or like corporate power suit women yeah. who like, I don't jive with any of them either. Uh, so you have this need, you attract these people by meetups and then the founding moms is born. That is similarly a little quite different from my story, but it's the same in the way of what I do now is teaching Josh 10 years ago. Like where I was a decade mm -hmm. ago is exactly who exactly. is like my prime customer. Uh, I, you know, I so. did have a head start because I had run two other businesses and made a billion mistakes. So I had something sure. to bring to the table, but it's pretty funny you say that because about a year in somebody said, Oh, so you're an expert in mom entrepreneurship. And I laughed at them and told them that was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever heard because what's mom entrepreneurship. Of course, fast forward to a decade later, everybody uses the word mompreneur. It wasn't a thing. So right, it, right. we've come a long way in having empathy for this crowd of folks that I work with. Uh, and I appreciate that. But so, so really to go all the way back, uh, I didn't mean to start it. I love that I sort of fell into it. That's the and best business. That's the best yeah, start of every business. And I'm continually learning from these women as I teach them. You know what I mean? So it's 
So I also love that community is now a hot commodity when it once was not. Yeah, because yeah. now there's this like beautiful understanding that a lot more people have of the back and forth that we have with the people who join our communities, you know? Yeah, and that's when we met through that circle event, I found out about you and about what you were doing with your community. And again, very different, but very same in principle okay. where it's like, yeah. I'm teaching freelance web designers, guys and gals, whatever. It doesn't matter where they are in the world, but we have a similar challenge and yes. we have similar aspirations and like-minded ways, even though our businesses might be different or we're different, right. but very similar in principle about getting like like-minded people with similar challenges together. Now yes. I would love to know, as a business model, this will get into, you know, how you keep your, your clients and limit churn and, and keep them coming back. Yeah. Uh, do you call them clients, community, tribe, student? What do you call your people? My members are members or founding moms. Okay. So you call them the founding moms or yeah. members? Yeah. A and new founding mom just joined us. She's a member. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And what do you offer them? You have the community aspect, of course. And then do you have programs like one-off services, courses? What else? What is, it, what is in your suite a, of offers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I'm going to rattle off everything that every other community has. We have a library of about over 80-ish courses, video courses. And we call them snack size because who has time? So I was going to say, yeah, those can't be like massive like, courses then. No, they're, they're 40 minutes long max. They're, they're cut up into 10 minute bite-sized bits with a workbook. Okay. Uh, so that's sort of the educational portion. We also have lots of live events. So we do anywhere from like, I host a monthly webinar where it's a lot of learning going on in a big fun way. Uh, we have hot seat sessions where a member's in the hot seat. We have a virtual co-working session. We have a lot of probably the sessions you have. Um, but those live events are, are in the most demand because they all end up being small group and folks get the most out of them. Okay, yeah. Uh, and then on top of all that, you know, we just, we have a lot of opportunities we look for for our members in by way of grants and sponsorships and PR. And I'm constantly trying to get our members out there in front of others. The reason I ask is so far we've identified who your quote unquote customer avatar is, but the trick is now, what do you offer them to help them and then keep them? So are the majority of your members, like, do you have those broken up to where people can just get those courses and resources or is, is it all under the membership? Like when somebody becomes a member, funny, it's just all together. Funny you ask, because you're talking to me in a moment where we went from piecemeal to tidying it up into one membership and we're about to go backwards halfway. Okay. And, and off something's piecemeal. Two steps forward, half yes. step back. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So we, we offer, uh, you know what? I like to go for the emotional jugular when talking about what we offer because uh, we mostly offer very practical tips and tricks and we don't talk about our kids and diapers. We, we talk mostly about marketing, branding, and sales, Okay. but we offer tons of inspiration and emotional wellness tips and tricks and ways that these women can understand that what they're selling and what they're doing is really, really freaking valuable to the world because as a mom entrepreneur in particular, you can get really lost in the world of, well, I need, I, I'm supposed to be paying attention to my kids. I have a lot of fear of letting a lot of people down. I'm pouring in more of my heart into what I'm doing than a traditional, you know, non-parent entrepreneur. There are a lot of stories that she tells herself. And so we do a lot of work with our members to make sure that they stay the course and have the confidence to build something fantastic, whatever that means. What percentage would you, this might be kind of difficult to answer. It doesn't have to be exact, but if you could give me like a guesstimate of the percentage of like returning customers month to month versus new customers for you. Cause a lot of people, again, just focus on new people, but you know with what? a community, I is it, I, yeah, I'm the flip side, but I've known that for a really long time, ever since before my entrepreneurial days, when I worked at a major record label in New York, your whole goal when you have an artist on a record label is to make sure that those fans come back to the next concert and the next concert after that. Great point. So, yeah. You know, customer attention to me was imparted at the beginning. So with every company I've launched, 
it ends up feeling very much for me like it's the same thing. So, you know, we offer a monthly webinar, particularly that specific event at the Founding Moms, to introduce you to who I am, to who we are, to what we offer, et cetera. It's the introductory. And at the end of it, I literally say, and come join us. So the monthly (laughs) webinar is public. That's not for current founding moms. That's for potential. Correct. But I was going to say to your question, unfortunately for me, it's mostly current paying members. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're just using uh, it as a chance to potentially have one more call with you or or learn something, which is fine too. They actually join because they want to see each other. Oh, uh, okay. And I, I had a lot of fun. If I do say so myself, there's a lot. Of I'm fun. sure those calls are a blast. <laughs> I'm about to put a wig on and jump on one of these founding <laughs> member call, founding uh, yeah, mom calls. I do, I do a lot of dress up, but um, I do think that they join and are, I, I've become so good at customer retention that I'm worse at the going and getting new folks. If that makes okay. sense. Okay. You know what? Yeah. But that's a bad problem to have because I feel like most entrepreneurs are the complete opposite. Most people are really good at new relationships and getting people interested. And as soon as they become a client, what happens? You're done with them. And that is so, especially in my world in web design, this is very, very common. This is why this is one of the biggest principles I preach to everyone listening and all my students. Do not be a cable company, meaning don't give like your most attention and best deals and offers to new people. And then once they sign up, you jack up their rates or you leave them hanging or you don't support them. That's the, that's the whole thing we want to avoid. It's exact opposite of what you want to do, especially with most business models. Now, like as a web designer, if we're charging on average two, three, four or $5,000 a website, maintenance, hosting, other services, you probably have at least a, you know, maybe a $5,000 a year client. So you don't need that many clients to get to six figures if you want to make six figs. So that's where like this idea of customer retention is super, super important. Again, different than a community, a membership, but a lot of the principles I'm sure are the same in like supporting them. Either I I mean, I had for my first business service-based, second business product-based, nothing in the way of customer retention values and plans uh, has changed like at all. Mm-hmm. I, I don't, I actually don't even fully understand why folks would pay. I'm so, it's so deeply ingrained in me. Why would you pay so much attention to somebody at the beginning? And I think, pay, and they're like, what? that's the part where the relationship is really beginning to blossom. I think there is a misconception on like a scarcity mindset. Like you just feel like you have to hustle and get new clients all the time. Like you need to be constantly in sales. I think some of that is, there's probably a lot of different reasons for that because I experienced some of that because I had to catch myself early on when I was growing my business. I realized I was talking to new clients, potential clients and doing projects. And then I, once I completed a website, I would say, see you later. Thanks for coming. And then I learned later on the old golden rule of sales that, you know, there are 20% of your clients that are paying you way more and they're going to be 10 times more likely to pay you over and over and over again. If you do a really good job and you don't need to start a new relationship, you can just stick with what you have. You can just build that relationship and set up because there's so much time and energy and effort that goes to landing somebody new. Whereas if somebody already knows, likes and trusts you, you're an automatic in. All you need to do is convert them over the line to buy something. Hundred. I, I was about to go hundred percent, but I think it's actually 80, 90% of <laughs> folks like that. That's how much people are chasing them. But you're, you're earning, as you said, you're earning so much less by doing all of that chasing to maybe land one person when all of the people who already love and trust you are ready to spend and spend some more and spend some more. You've got them locked in, pay attention to them. Yeah. So yeah, it makes me very upset when I don't see folks doing that. And I and- just yesterday spoke to somebody who runs a community. I'm sorry. I spoke to somebody who is a member of another community and was raving to me about how it looks on the site and how the community is built and it looks so wonderful. And she sort of dropped her voice and said, well, once you're in there, they don't really pay attention to you. So it kind of sucks. But there it is. Yeah. I thought, well, that's the whole, you're going to leave. I didn't say this to her, but you know, you're going to leave at some point very soon because it's unsatisfying and you're not getting it. 
it's the same thing with like a one-off web design job. Well, I always teach to do hosting and maintenance. So you build your recurring income and keep your clients coming back, yeah. stay top of mind month after month. But even if you do a one-off website project for my audience, it's like you still, when, once you make the sale, that is when the relationship starts. It's not yeah. when you're done. It's not like a, you're oh, yeah. not a used car salesman and you sell it and you're like, whoo, all right, see you later. That is when things start and you should lay the groundwork for building that relationship for hopefully years. So when did you figure that out? I think probably it was at least a few years in to my journey because I didn't have recurring income. I, I came from again, the band world, I did not, just like you, I did not set out to say, I'm going to start this business and this is what I'm going to do. Here's my plan. I fumbled into it. I was an accidental entrepreneur, as they yeah. say. And uh, yeah. once I got more serious about growing my business, I realized that as I got better as a web designer and as I got more familiar with some of my clients, they started coming back. And then I realized like maybe I should intentionally keep in touch with them. So I started doing hosting and maintenance. And then I started doing like more email follow-ups. And I do want to ask and talk about some ideas about how we can practically keep retention. Um, but that's what I started doing is it just, I, I realized I had a few really good clients that were like asking me to do more. And, I, and it dawned on me, ding, duh, why, aren't, why aren't I offering this and intentionally staying top of mind and intentionally making them a, a constant conversation. So that's kind of how I fell into it. That fell okay. into retention, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. And again, I, I don't blame anyone for having that sale, sale, sale mentality. Um, because I think it's really common depending on what your background is, but the, the good news is now, and I think the reason this is so important is we need to say, hold on, yeah. You don't have to hustle, 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 sell, sell, sell all yeah. the time. If you keep your clients coming back, uh, really actually, quick, really quick, don't. quick question on hustle while we're at it. Yeah. What's what's your thoughts on hustle? I think it's very silly now. I think it's really hard to unlearn. Uh, I hustled real hard for the first few years of running multiple businesses. Uh, and I had that mentality you're describing the, like, if I, if I don't keep going the scarcity bit, you know, I'm not going to have any business. No one's going to work with me. And it took too long for me to realize that the more I was hustling, the more I was killing myself and not really getting more business in. Mm. So I sort of like, I remember the first phase of going, wait a second, do I have to keep doing it this way? I rearranged my schedule. I would like go in and lie to myself and put in like this chunk of time I'm in Cancun so that when I was on a call, I would look at it and go like, no, I'm sorry, I'm busy. And I opened up my calendar so much more that I started working only four days a week instead of five. And then that kind of left me enough time and breathing room to go, why am I standing in my standing desk for 12 hours a day? I don't really need to be nursing my children in this tiny home. Office. I could go out sometime. So it just was, it's been a very, very slow evolution to a place where now I feel badly for people who feel like they need to hustle, hustle, hustle. Um, yeah. I even think making it look like you're hustling is doing a disservice to every other entrepreneur. We need to give each other permission to take a day off. Yeah. To like not pack your schedule. You know? Well, they, yeah, not pack your schedule. Yeah. There, there's certainly a, I feel like a new wave of anti hustle in some ways. Yeah. And the thing is, is I've, yes, I, it's funny because I have tried to like retrain myself as well because I am a worker at heart. I have zero problems getting my work boots on and just going. But I have learned that to quote unquote, move the needle forward in my business and to focus on the bigger things and for the health of myself and my family and to be present with them, I do have to be very careful about how much I'm working, how much I'm hustling, and yeah. to make sure I don't take it in every aspect of my life. Like if I, if we're watching a hockey game and I'm playing with my girls, I'm doing those things. I'm not checking my email, not doing anything else. Now I do work really hard still, but I don't work every day, 24 yeah. seven. And I, and I've also learned, I'm sure you've learned this too. It's like sometimes hustle is seasonal. So if I'm creating a course and I'm launching, I'm going to be doing a little more work in that time. 
Whereas right. if we're in a past a course launch and there's a break and I'm just doing consistent content, mm -hmm. it's less hustle and an easier sure. schedule. Have you, sure. have you abided by that kind of schedule as a mompreneur yourself? Well, we have times of the year where mom entrepreneurs check out, you know, summertime, everybody's kids are on vacation. So there's just less activity overall, which is really nice. And we honor it. And so we don't schedule giant festivals or big events during the summer. So we have very busy times of the year. Uh, I always try to take a tech break once a quarter, where mm. for three days, two or three days, I literally don't look at a piece of technology, including my phone. Awesome. Uh, I, I've over time tried to insert more and more, uh, which is not only a practice in not overworking, but also in being able to hand things off to other people and not have control over every single piece. And it, there's just a lot that has gone into being okay with it because it's easy to do, but you have to be okay with doing it. Otherwise it's not going to be effective. You know, great point. Yeah, that's huge. And I'm curious back to the, like this idea of your, so, you know, again, even like that, you know, your customers, you know, there's busy times when those times are going to be, yeah. and when there's going to be time off. So you can account for that. Yeah. I'm curious when yeah. somebody, when you land somebody as a member or in one of your, how high touch is the experience? Like, do you, I, I tend to offer a pretty high touch experience to make that first impression be like awesome. For example, I what send all work? my new students personal videos, a quick personal video saying, Hey, welcome to the course. Great to have you. No other course creators send personal videos. That's why I do it because no I one else is doing that. it. So do you have like personal touches like that, that are more high I'm touch? Sure so when you ask that, I'm like, uh, I feel like I do, but I don't think I do. If you compare it to somebody who makes personal videos for every single person, uh, we, I personally message everybody who joins us every single time they join us. That's cool. That said, some of the things I will list off are automated. Don't tell anybody. That's all right. They look like it's me. Look personal. Yeah. Not me. Uh, so there, you know, we, I like very high touch. I talk about it in terms of handholding. So from uh, greeting her one-on-one, -on -one, messaging her within our circle platform to uh, having a very specific set of emails go out to her to literally having members of our team check in with her. There's nice. a lot, there's like almost maybe too much <laughs> because some people join us and they're just like, I'm just here for the education, leave me alone. Or, mm. you know, I, 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 I definitely... I think it's better that you over communicate with them and you over help them than that feeling like the person you mentioned a little bit ago where they're like, you join, it looks great, but you just kind of get left there. I agree with you. I'd rather overdo it, except that what's interesting is I think we're so high touch at the founding moms that we've actually heard from a number of members not, not said this way, but kind of, you know, Hey, just leave me, leave me to it. Just let, let me, me do my uh, thing. yeah. Well, you look, it's like <laughs> yeah, a grandma yeah, yeah. pinch, pinching the cheeks of a baby, like one pinch, but all right, exactly, give them some space. So Jill, exactly. give your members also, a little space. <laughs> yeah. And we have, we have texts that go out and remind people, which feels very personal about upcoming things or I'll send something mm. inspirational. We, we try to cover all bases because my years of emailing, posting to social media have taught me you can post to social 40 times and email 25 times and people can still miss. Yeah, so, I, I've learned that. And I was going to ask you about like your, your ongoing calls. Cause do you do like office hours or weekly calls with members to where I know you, you mentioned earlier, you have like events. Yeah, we, well, we, we sort of switched up recently, but we have a lot of these small group calls, calls, live events, video chats okay, with members, yeah. uh, and you know, there's only a certain percentage of the membership that takes advantage all the time. And those that do, yeah. I'm sure you have the same thing. Same thing. Yep. Smaller percentage. Yeah. Like, so my coaching community, which is my premium club, um, okay. what's interesting is, yeah, same thing. Like a smaller percentage of them are there almost every call all the time. Yeah. Those are the ones who are really driving it. Then there's the people who are really busy. They just don't have as much time to, to dive yeah. in. Most of them get more coaching from me and then they'll occasionally sprinkle it. And there's the people who are kind of the creepers, which is fine too. You need the people who are just going to pop in every once in a while and they're just checking things out. Um, right. But for like the calls, I found the same thing. I started doing email reminders the day before the day of, and then I'm a, the biggest thing for me that I found that helped is I'm live now and I'm live now email Dang. game 
changing. And mm-hmm. I told my members, I'm like, I'm sorry, you guys are getting hit like crazy. I, I was, I asked them like, do you want me to remove one of them? All of them said, no, no keep them going. Don't mind. Keep We've them done going the same because thing. Keep we're them all coming. busy. Yeah. You, you could yeah. you could email me and say, Hey Josh, I got a call in an hour. I'm like, okay, I want to jump on Jill's call. Next thing I know the hour is yeah. gone. I'm like, Oh shit, Jill's live. If you get that, I'm live now that is yeah, a yeah, big, yeah. big help. Yeah. You know? That's a great suggestion. And I might lift that from you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. I yeah, would we, recommend everyone doing that. If you're doing any sort of like webinar sort or of training. As it is, it is kind of mind blowing how many times you can contact people and I will have members say, Oh, you're doing that. I never saw it. And it's like, we literally sent 72 notifications about it in various ways. Right. Uh, there are yeah. people who have like thousands of unread emails, which just stresses me out to my core. So well, that's, those... that's why we moved to texting. So we okay. thought we'll, yeah. we'll just go around that inbox all together and we'll be in your hand. Uh, and that seems to be going really well, but then people fear getting too many notifications. So they, not a lot of yeah. them have signed up for it yet. It's, it's a, it's a constant work in progress, as you know, and it's constant yeah. checking in with the communities to see what's working. Um, and I, I think I lost the answer, the main answer to the question you asked. Oh, that's all right. I think we got there. I was just kind of curious, like what okay. you were doing ongoing, but I would oh, love to ask about, so we, we talked about high touch in the beginning, whatever yeah. that looks like some automations really empowering yeah. them talked about some sort of like ongoing, you know, call office hours, community, whatever it is. It's different for yeah. web design clients. They may just need a quarterly check-in or ideally email is a big part of it. Still, right. it looks like you guys are using the, that's one thing. If I could go back, I would tell myself 10 years ago, put all of your clients on an email list, even if it's 20 clients. I would tell you that too. And just email them once a month with something, yeah. stay top of mind. Um, but then- now? I do it with my students. Um, so my, I, I send a lot of emails out. I send every pot, every time I release a podcast, they get an email. Anytime okay. I do a new tutorial email, um, yeah. any sort of special offer or webinar, masterclass, whatever it is. So most people are going to get an email from me generally at least twice a week. So I'm okay. always, always, you know, right around yeah. ready for them to, to help out. Um, but my next question was going to be when the relationship is gone for a little while, and maybe three months in, five, six months in, that's generally when things get a little stale. How do you circle back around with them and get them re-engaged? Do you personally do anything? Are there automated things that you do to keep people coming back in that stale period? More automated than not, we have a six month check-in that's a drip mm. campaign. So we'll sort of Ooh, say like, nice. hey, you've been here a bit, how's it going? Uh, we, so it's a big jump, but after the six month mark, similar at a year, but then we'll wait two more years. We have very long-term members. So at the three year mark- Good for you, wow. We flip a lot of our members into becoming mentors for the newer members. Ah. So that they sort of have like a new purpose within our community uh, so that they continue to hang out, provide experience and knowledge. And we're, we're considering introducing a couple of more automated ways to keep people talking to one another. Um, Gosh, I love that idea. Like I was thinking like a three month check-in, maybe a six month check-in, an annual check-in for sure. And then once they get to a certain point. The three month mark to me, they're just getting settled. They've just come off of that whole intro sequence or whatever you're doing. So to me, I, we don't even check in at three months. We just wait mm. till the six month mark where maybe we lost her for a month or maybe she just got busy uh, and pick it up. And maybe that's a big mistake, but that's that's what happens with our members right now. Yeah, I feel like three months from my community is is gonna tell me whether they're serious and they're gonna stick around mm-hmm. or whether they're just kind of trying it out and then they're gonna they're gonna leave for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, so I think for me, it would be more of a like, Hey, how are you finding things so far? What do you need yeah. help with? How can I better have more of like a, a, a little bit of a lagged, almost like the last onboarding type of yeah. approach with it. So yeah. I like that. The idea of member to mentors though, is really cool too. We need to do a whole separate episode of workshop on community. Cause that's fascinating. <laughs> um, maybe we can okay. team up and do something for circle about that. Cause that is really, really yeah, interesting. For sure. Cause what do you do with folks if they're still hanging out in there and you don't, you just don't want to forget about them. Now, what about clients, service related website design clients? Let's say I design a client site. It's been two years, three years. Haven't talked to them. Feel a little weird. Want to see how they're doing. Are they how a do you feel about that? 
at that point? No. So my, my community okay. are web designers. So for my, for my web design audience who are building sites for clients, they're likely going to be hosting and maintaining their site. So they'll get like monthly reports, but the idea of like intentionally circling back around to either do a website redesign or maybe upsell for a new service. What are your thoughts on how to approach that? If you haven't talked to a client I, in a couple of yeah, years, or... I definitely email is like hands down the number one way, unless you're savvy enough to get into their DMS, wherever they are, but somehow landing in their inbox for them to go. Oh yeah. So my example for this is always my favorite photographers have a regular newsletter that goes out maybe once a month, once every other month. And it literally just includes three of their latest photos from their latest shoot. Mm. The only reason I love it is because it reminds me they exist. Because the moment I have a need, I'm going to remember Gary Smith that just emailed me over the long yes. list of photographers I've collected over the years. Way to go, Gary. Yeah, listen. Exactly. The, exactly. There is nothing wrong with staying top of my clients will forget about you. And yes. it's nothing personal. Everyone's busy. Some of my clients, like, you know, three years after I designed their site, if I didn't have a close relationship, they'd be like, who did our site? Was it Jeremy? No, it was John. It was definitely John. And then they're <laughs> going to look for John and they're not going to find John in the email. And then they're oh, yeah. going to forget who designed their site. Oh, yeah. Whereas if I email them once a month with something yeah. portfolio tips on web design trends, something new, whatever it is, Jill's new podcast, whatever. If we email that, they top of mind is so, so crucial with retention. My gosh, yeah. it's key. It's, uh, it's really, really tough because if you also then opt to email folks once a month for the rest of your life or their lives, and let's say they just finished working with you, six months goes by, they don't need you, Josh. They don't need you. They're going to unsubscribe. And then you don't have a way to really get in touch with them without manually going in and emailing mm. them a year later, which is too much work for you, but maybe it's not if you really think that they'll come back and buy something. So there, there are multiple ways, but the only ways that I have seen work for folks are email or somehow catching them on social and reminding them you exist. Yeah. And that can be tricky depending on the industry for sure. Especially now because social media is so scattered. Now there are people who are like strictly Instagram, strictly LinkedIn, strictly Facebook, Correct. Strictly God hard. knows what else. I can, like, yeah, that's well, really you're not difficult. Adding your previous former clients to its own community where maybe you don't have ongoing things, but like so I, I actually, I sold my web design agency in 2020 to one of my students oh. because it was oh. all client it was all client based and I just could not do both anymore. And I, wa yeah. I wasn't burned out or anything. I just, I, I, my courses were growing and my audience of web designers were growing. I came to a point where I was like, I have to decide what I have to do one or the other. I don't have the bandwidth to do both. So, um, yeah, all my clients went to one of my students. I'm essentially kind of a consultant for the, for the agency now. So they are, they are the agency's clients and I check and I still know a lot of them personally and stuff. Um, but okay. yeah, my audience right now are web designers and, and web printers. So yeah, that's where the difference is. But at the same time, I still similar to you. I learned a lot as a service provider and I took that right into doing courses because yeah. like the personal video, I started my conversion rate went gangbusters when yeah. I did personal videos for proposals. And I was like, Hey client, I just want to walk you through the proposal. Here's the goals. It was just like, I was, I would meet with them in person and I got such a high conversion rate on proposals. Yeah. When I started doing that, I was like, I am going to be doing videos in this business too. And then luckily right now I'm at a point where I can manage it. I do 10 to 20 personal videos per week, usually for new students, okay. sometimes okay. a little less, sometimes a little more. Um, yeah. so it's manageable and I do them quick. Yeah. They're like 30 second, 45 second videos. And I have a template that I put, a, put it into a own cameo company. Yeah. I guess so. I didn't think about it like that, but yeah, yeah, it's yeah. true. Yeah. But that go, it goes such a long way and it, it really, it breeds into this like first amazing experience of when right. somebody signs up with you that they're like, Oh my gosh, I'm in, this is awesome. Like yeah. how supported do I feel? Which, which right. keeps that retention. Right. Oh, I love that. I love That's that. what's worked for me at least. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. And I think a lot of people write off ideas like yours because they go, ah, I'll never get to it. That's too much time for me. And they're not realizing, no, 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 no. That's what's going to make you a lot more money. Yeah. So to write it off right away, because you don't think your time is just short-sighted. 
Yeah. Oh, so a plug for, this is for you, Jill, and for everyone listening. Um, I was recently on Pat Flynn's podcast for episode 563. The reason I say that is because I actually think you would really enjoy, it's a really, it's an in-depth look at all of the strategies that I've used to grow my business awesome. without being harsh and salesy. So I say that to say, you might actually really find that interesting. I love um, it. Love if it. you're interested yeah. in checking it out. And for everyone listening, you can just go to smartpassiveincome.com slash session563 or listen to the SPI podcast. It was uh, episode 563. You were on there. So, very fancy of you. Yeah. Oh, very fancy. I just say that because that really dives into more detail on those, those basic principles that are counterintuitive, that aren't like the hot, like sales, sales, you know, hustle, hustle, which is much, yeah. much more grabby on right. social media these days. Right. So yeah. Love it. But I like that. I, look, I know we're already getting close to an hour. I can't believe this is, we've been going for almost an hour already. Do you have like a hard stop at 2.30 Central? I don't or do have you? a hard stop. I have a soft stop. We can do okay. like 15 over. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure just in case we need to like stop the call. So a lot of good things so far. I mean, really, we covered a lot about retention, yeah, including all the stuff leading up to yeah. it, knowing your demographic, high, you know, whatever you can do to personalize and high touch experiences to really keep them going. There's ongoing type of support calls, automated type of uh, touches via email, text, whatever that looks like. One last area I'd love to focus on real quick would be like upsells. Um, because this is one of the best ways to get people to come back to you is a different service or something new. How do you go about doing upsells or like new services to people? Because you don't want to like take advantage of your current clients, but at the same time, like we talked about, they will be a hundred times more likely to buy from you because they already know you and hopefully yeah. they already like you and trust you. So what are your thoughts on how to do we upsells? Don't, we don't do major overarching launches with the upsells. We normally... You sprinkle it in? I was just going to say, it's like a trickling. We just like... Okay, a trickle. Sprinkle it into like our, our the newsletter. They'll see it on the blog. They'll see it in the socials. And my hope is that it just tweaks the brainwave slightly and they go, huh, that's interesting. So that when I trickle it in again through a couple of emails, they buy. Okay. Uh, and, and usually that works. We've partnered with an organization to offer the ability for you to find and hire virtual assistants really easily through us. Mm. Uh, and every single time I mention it, a slew of folks join, uh, buy. Awesome. Awesome. And it's a little bit different with a, a business model like yours versus a service where you maybe have 20 clients because you can take a more personal, like one-on-one -on -one approach. Like for example, one thing I teach in a couple of my courses, my maintenance plan course and my business course is that you follow up with clients later on, like after a year or, you know, whatever it is, and then yeah. maybe offer a free like strategy call or yeah. a consult call just to see how things are going, give them some free advice, which is the perfect segue or an upsell, whatever that is. And it can be soft because you just Absolutely. gave them free value. Where I like very soft. And in fact, I don't know if it's that different because what we should be doing that we aren't doing yet is going to any members that a year ago decided to cancel. And usually mm. they'll tell us it's because they moved. It's because they feel like they ran out of money. They might be in a different life stage in the moment. And if we circled back and said, hey, if you come back in, you know, you might be ready now. We just don't yet. Mm, we yeah. don't have a solid way to do that, but I don't think that's so different. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I've considered doing that too, is like just reach it. Cause I do not take it personally. I had, I had to tell myself oh. early on when I started a community, people are going to leave. Don't yeah. be offended. Don't be hurt. Sometimes they don't want to, but yeah, like financially things are tricky or they're in a different position or they're in a different season of life and they just not going to be invested for a little while. Right. But the idea of circling back to them is definitely very, really, really valid. So it's also really scary because they already they said no. So you're kind of yeah. going, you know, no is never final in my world when I reach out to the press, when I'm doing any pitching of any kind. But when they cancel a membership, I'm going, well, okay, bye forever. But Good I shouldn't point. be, you yeah. know, so it's not fun. It's not well, especially if like if you have new resources and there's new stories and there's, exactly. you know, like if there's, there's so, so much more value that they're probably missing out on. Right. Um, so no, yeah. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Jill, this has been awesome. Um, I'm so glad this has been awesome. You make wanna, this very easy. 
Well, I'm super, I'm super glad you came on. This was really fun. Like I said, when I met you on the, the panel, I was like, I'm getting her on because we could have all sorts of fun chats here. We're definitely, I want to do a separate one on community, but I would actually honestly love to end if, would you give me the permission to give you some coaching ideas for like five minutes? Yes, please. Okay. Before well, we do that. Permission. That's hilarious. Yeah. I'll bill you afterwards though. I'll bill you the hourly no? rate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I just, cause I have, I just have these, I have this idea after hearing, seeing your setup, I got to get it out. Otherwise I'm not going to I love it. Sleep. I love it. No, give it to me. Before we get to that though, okay. f- first off, where would you like everyone to go to find out more about you? Is Do you want everyone to check well, out the podcast? Go to foundingmoms.com. Go there. You can find us anywhere. Again, we're all over the socials. You can find Founding Mom at Founding Mom. At, wherever you want to go, put in Jill Salzman or Founding Moms. You'll find us. Come say hi. Uh, yeah. Okay. Five-minute coaching advice while I still have a yes. few minutes with you. I, and again, I don't mean to like force my coaching strategy ideas on you, but I just feel I like I, it is most I can't, welcome at this okay. Time. I just can't believe you don't have this. I really feel you should have the founding moms podcast. That I, is so funny you say that because I fight it with every fiber of my being, but see, and here's, I can't tell you why. Here's so, why I think so. I, I'm gonna hear I love your, your, why we're shouting podcast. It's really cool. Yeah. It's narrative. It's different. <laughs> But, and I think you could still do that because it's more broad entrepreneurial, but here's something I've actually learned from Amy Porterfield more recently, which is that when you have a like ideal customer avatar, if you focus the majority of your content and stuff to them, you will capture other people. Like you'll capture some entrepreneurial folks. You may not capture dads with a founding, you know, mom's things, but that's okay. You're that's, that's your person. So. I think if you had the Founding Moms podcast, it would open up a slew of this idea of retention. And here's- When you say that though, can I ask a question? Sure, sure. Do you mean, like, would it be okay by you if I were to take off the title of the current one and just call it the Founding Moms podcast? Or do you mean to have something different happen? I would do separate because your your current- your current podcast is cool because it's all about mistakes and blunders and issues that you give your narrative approach to. But what I envision and what I would just see so powerful for you as the podcast for the founding moms is that you have this community and you probably are connected with a slew of mom entrepreneurs and it could be casual interview style. What you're doing right now, I know you love doing just a casual chat. You could do that once a week for your founding mom's yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah. And you could bring no, on, oh my gosh, you yeah. could bring on successful members who have had a lot of success as kind of case studies. You could have solo episodes where you just share half an hour about a lesson that you've learned as, as a founding mom. I just, I see your brand and it strikes me as odd that you don't have the founding's <laughs> mom podcast. And here's the thing too, this is one thing I've learned with the podcast as well, as, as you probably know, once you do an interview with somebody or an episode and you give them kind of a, we'll call it like a launch pack of graphics or whatever they want to use to share it, suddenly they share it with their audience. Oh, so you sure. don't, you don't need to market. You don't, I mean, you can, but right, that's right, just right. like, why do it yourself and pay Facebook ads when you can have someone else who you interviewed and then they share it. And then especially for founding moms. This is a big, because a lot of web designers that I thought, well, if, if we do launch that, it's going to be the founding moms podcast by Jill Salzman and Josh Hall. There it is. There it is. I I just, I think, I I just think it would be so powerful for you. you. I totally hear you. You have the best point. I have a litany of reasons that we don't need to get into now as to why (laughs) I'm opposed, but it's years. I used to have a different podcast for six years with a guy named Brad Ferris. It was called Mm. the Breaking Down Your Business Podcast. Similarly, and to your point, he and I launched it together and he thought it was gonna help him build his, he didn't have a community, but his people, his business. And I, at the time thought, well, that'll help, you know, find some founding moms. And of course it didn't because it was called the Breaking Down Your Business Podcast. So it's not like I went into this not knowing that, but. Yeah, that's the other, the last thing I'll say. I, I know, appreciate I really you here. Yeah. yeah. The, the last thing I'll say, and I, th- I think why it's extra powerful for you is that yeah. mompreneurs tend to hang out with mompreneurs. So if you interview one mompreneur and she shares it in a group 
Like that could yeah. be hundreds of people who are really curious to, to join right. your community. So I love it. Um, I love it. Yeah. You're, you're helping me go viral. Yeah. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I had to get it out there. Cause I feel like, gosh, it would, I would, it would be no, so I powerful. Love that. I love that. It's so important to you. It's really helpful to hear. Well, and if it's our, I think just like with the way, with the way sales and marketing are now, like it's you and I are on the same wavelength of how we want to, we want to soft sell. We don't want to like buy yeah. this now in your face kind of marketing. Yeah, I'd much yeah, rather yeah. just have a conversation and share stories and wins and lessons learned and let that organically bring the right people to you. So it just sure. seems to me that in your marketing efforts, it could be a pretty cool thing, but I love it. Um, I lo thank yeah. you for sharing. Yes. Please invoice me after this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a discount hour for the coaching session. Uh, but no, Jill, this was great. I really, really enjoyed it. This was hearing. awesome. I'd love to do this again at some point. And you are yeah. still welcome to come on to the podcast we shall not name. I would, <laughs> I would, I'd be happy to. Yeah, no <laughs> deal. And then, even, yeah, one day of Founding Moms makes it as a podcast. By golly. Yes, you're uh, getting all the credit. All the credit. Let's do it. Yeah, I'll take 10% and we'll call it awesome. even. All good. Okay. Okay, All good. right, Joe. Well, thank you so much for your time. This was a blast. You, we'll definitely I really have you. appreciate it. This was awesome. Thank we'll you we'll for do a round two. My, my sweater and my backdrop. I appreciate I it. I loved it. It was awesome. This is by far the most colorful, colorful interview I've ever done. Same. Same. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks, Jill. Talk soon. Okay. Bye. Hey guys and gals, just wanted to pop in with a couple things before you head out. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this podcast. I would love to hear your feedback and it will also help other web designers find the show. Be sure to check out the show notes for this episode. Just go to joshhall.co, click on podcasts and search this episode number and you'll find all the links, descriptions and resources we talked about. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and you'll be notified when the next episode is live. Thanks again for tuning in and I'll catch you guys on the next episode.